has been said, my name's Andrew, um, and uh, I live in Croxley Green, so not too far away from here. Um, I'm married to my wife, um, and I'm speaking about marriage this morning. It's a difficult morning for me, because sadly, uh, my wife has just left me um, to go to America for a week. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and um, so I'm, ho- I'm with my three children. We've got three kids, um, and I'm trying to look after them, so uh, I'm in that zone at the moment. Um, but it's great to be with you. I love this church from the little I've got to know it, Simon and, and the leaders, Uh, We had a great uh, evening together just a week ago, and uh, New Frontiers as a movement has been a big influence on my life over the years, so I feel at home and feel part of this, which is great, but we're talking about uh, marriage, is that right? Uh, That's what we're looking at um, today, and uh, we're actually going to look in the Bible at a perfect marriage. Um, So if you've got a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at that in a moment, but as you turn there, um, I heard of another perfect marriage, I want to tell you the story of that. Once upon a time... There was a perfect man and a perfect woman. And uh, they met, and after a perfect courtship, they had a perfect wedding and uh, got married. One day, their life, though perfect, at snowy Christmas time, they were driving along a country lane in their perfect car when they noticed someone distressed at the side of the road. And being the perfect couple, they stopped to help. And there stood Santa Claus. Um, And Santa Claus had a huge bundle of toys, but had broken down. Now, not wanting to disappoint the children at Christmas time, the perfect couple loaded Santa and his toys and began driving from house to house to deliver the toys. Unfortunately, the driving conditions deteriorated and the perfect couple and Santa had an accident. And very sadly, only one of them survived. I wonder if you can work out who was the survivor. And of course, the answer is the perfect woman survived. She's the only one who ever existed in the first place. Is that right, ladies? Everyone knows there's no such thing as Santa Claus, and everyone knows there's no such thing as the perfect man. Is that true? <laughs> so, <laughs> so if there's no perfect man and no Santa Claus, the perfect woman must have been driving the car. And that explains why there was an accident. <laughs> there's something for everyone in that, assuming you're male or female this morning. Um, but anyway... Perfect couples. Do we believe in perfect couples? You know, I think there are some people who do believe in, the, in perfect marriages today, um, and they're called single people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everyone else who's been married probably realizes that the idea of a perfect marriage um, is far from the reality of the nitty-gritty of life that we live in. We've been married for 13 years now, uh, and with three kids to boot, uh, we have, a, a, I think, a wonderful marriage, but it's far from perfect, m- mainly because of me. Um, Oh, I know. And uh, it may be that actually for some of us, talking about marriage this morning is a little bit sensitive because your marriage has been far from perfect or you're not married and you wish that you were or you were married and it actually came to an end. So I just wanted to acknowledge that I appreciate I'm kind of preaching on eggshells this morning. In fact, I even put a picture of an eggshell on the next slide. There's a sensitivity to this subject, isn't there? Because in a room of this many people, with the statistics of society brought to bear on it, I'm sure that many of us have been through some pain or even just wish we were married, and that's painful. So I'm going to talk this morning about God's perfect plan for marriage, the perfect pattern, but I just want to pray that God will give you grace if what you live with is far from perfect. Is that okay? Well, we're going to look at the perfect marriage from Ephesians chapter 5, where the perfect marriage is actually between Christ and the church, and that becomes the pattern and the power for our marriages. So we're reading from Ephesians chapter 5, Uh, And reading from verse 20, um, uh, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also, wives, you should submit to your husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing through water and the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without blemish or stain or wrinkle, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands, you ought to love your wives as your own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it. And cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, 
A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Well, in the culture in which we live, this is a far from straightforward passage, isn't it? Um, And uh, I was speaking actually at a wedding recently, uh, my own sister's wedding, and uh, some of my family, extended family were there who aren't Christians, and I got an interesting conversation with them because um, I sort of pointed out that there's something interesting or strange, isn't there, that in the 21st century, in order to find guidance about marriage, we're still reading something from the first century. And more than that, written by a single guy (laughs) in the first century. Now that strikes you as odd, doesn't it? What on earth has a single guy in the first century got to say about marriage in the 21st? What what did he know? It's an odd thing, isn't it? And uh, my cousins were listening to the talk, and they really loved the talk. They said, you're an amazing speaker. But they said, it's almost like you're trying to persuade us, and you're really good at it, but persuade us to get back to using typewriters. (laughs) That's what one of my cousins said. You know, we've moved on. You know, you may be great, you've got the gift of the gab, but why would we go back to typewriters? As if to say, this pattern for marriage is a typewriter in the age of iPads and iPhones, etc. It's out of date, it's redundant. Now, of course, we would agree with them if all we thought this was, was the ideas of a first century guy who'd never been married. Well, of course, forget it then, what does he know? But we believe that actually, though the Apostle Paul was the writer... We believe that inspired by God in such a way that God is in fact the author. So Paul's the writer, but God's the author. So that the ideas are not so much the ones that came from Paul's mind, but were transmitted through Paul's mind into this text. In other words, the big claim is, and Paul here you notice is quoting right back to Genesis as if to say, what this is all based on is not my ideas, but God's plan for marriage. And it traces right back to when he made us male and female. Now, if that's the case, I don't know if you ever looked at the back of a bottle or a piece of equipment, and it says on it, for best results, follow the maker's instructions. (laughs) And I would want to bring that to bear on marriage. You know, for those of us who are married, for those of us who will get married, what we're claiming is that this is the maker's instructions. And for best results, follow them. Follow the maker's instructions. Amen? So in this 21st century, we read a first century text because we believe that God's pattern for marriage hasn't changed. And yet we also acknowledge that in the 21st century, we've got to explain this a bit. We've got to work a bit harder to understand, well, what does this mean today? Because otherwise our society looks at this and thinks this is wrong. You you know, that's what's being said today, isn't it? That, That culture is right and scripture by virtue of that is wrong. And uh, it it reminds us of the challenge that we're in. I remember um, hanging a picture for my wife. Um, She, uh, before we were married, actually, she lived in a sort of old cottage. And it was a cute cottage, quaint, but crooked. You know, every wall, every window was slightly crooked. Nothing was straight. It wasn't a modern house. You know these kinds of cottages? And and she said to me, could you hang this picture in the lounge? So uh, I took out my um, my tools and I took out a spirit level, you know, these, uh, these things that give the definition of straight. And I hung the picture using the spirit level and I got it straight. And I checked that the bubble was exactly between the lines. It was absolutely straight. I stepped back from it. I looked at it and thought, that's not straight. <laughs> so I went back to it with the spirit level and I put it back on. It's straight. I stepped back. That's not straight. Charlotte comes into the room and says, that's not straight. <laughs> I said, it is straight, let me show you, look, here's the spirit level, it's straight. And of course, it was straight, but because everything else around it was crooked, it looked like it was the problem. All the walls were bowed, all the windows frames were slightly twisted, and as a result, you hang something straight and you think, it's not straight. Let me tell you, this is straight and true. God's word is the Holy Spirit level of what is true. And yet society looks at it and says, it's not straight. (laughs) <laughs> that's wrong. It's the problem. And I want to encourage us to take God's word and say, no, Lord, we believe that this is the correct picture for marriage, even in the 21st century. And we want you to show us how to align it and how to align our marriages with your word. Amen. So let's hang some straight pictures, shall we, by looking at God's instructions for the husband um, and the wife. And do you notice, uh, as we get into the pattern of marriage then, do you notice that There's different instructions for the male and the female because God, according to both the Bible and biology, God's made us different, hasn't he? Let's be honest. Men and women are literally wired. We're wired differently, aren't we? 
as the next picture, I think, shows, we're, we're wired um, slightly differently as, as men and women. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen this diagram before, but um, I think probably designed by a man uh, who fails to understand the complexities of women, um, we are wired differently. Would you agree? And actually, it's been biologically shown that a man's brain works differently from a woman's. As you see on the next slide, the male brain is, <laughs> works in a completely different way um, to, to the woman. Sorry, I wasn't sure if I could get away with this at, at church. But I thought it was funny, so I, I'm sorry if you don't. Please, seriously, forgive me if you don't find that funny. But I thought it was funny. And actually, there's evidence for this. Um, let's take the sport of cricket, for example. Did you know that in the 1890s, men playing cricket realized this ball is hard. It could hurt. So they, they designed a box to protect a man's vital organ. Uh, and, uh, and then it wasn't until the 1980s that they thought, maybe we should wear something on our heads. <laughs> so I rest my case. You know, uh, this, is, this is the sad thing about men and uh, where their priorities lie. So anyway, men and women are different, as proven by cricket. And uh, so the point is, please forgive me if you don't find that funny, but the point is that in this passage, the Bible acknowledges we've got to talk to men and women differently. And did you notice it starts with... The ladies, ladies first, uh, which in a culture that didn't do that is all part of scripture turning culture on its head and actually arguing for male and female equality, that God made male and female in his image. So let's address the ladies first is the way this passage goes. So moving on, we have the challenge then, ladies, nevertheless, of working out what it means to say, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. When I put in the word submission into Google images, one of the images that came up was this. And I thought, well, that pretty much sums up what our culture thinks uh, this passage must mean. Um, and, uh, and yet, you notice that it's not that the wives are told by their husbands to submit to the Lord. No, the wives are addressed as equals, and in fact, given first place. So the passage never says, husbands, get your wives to submit to you, which is the connotation of this. And any husband that's ever tried to do that has already failed. <laughs> Because there is no passage in scripture that invites the husband to try and get his wife to submit to him. That, that is not in the Bible. So don't do it. You've already lost if you're trying to do that. Rather, it's the wives that are invited to take up their calling with honor in the relationship. And as they decide to take up this calling, they're in good company. Because Christ himself is a model for one in submission. Christ submits to the Father. This is one of the themes of scripture, that though they are equals, yet in another sense, there is both equality and diversity in how they relate. And so Christ, uh, we're told in, in 1 Corinthians 11, that the head of every man is God and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. So Christ himself knows what it means to be under headship to which he is in submission. Now, now consequently, ladies, as you take up your calling to be in submission to your husbands, you follow in the footsteps of Christ himself who, though he was in equality, one with God, did not consider that equality something to be grasped at. But no, he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. So you follow Jesus as you fulfill um, this calling. Now, all of that said, perhaps we should say a few words about what this doesn't mean before we perhaps think about what it does mean. What, what does it not mean for wives to submit to their husbands? I don't know if you've seen the film Stepford Wives, but uh, if you have seen the film Stepford Wives, this is not a pattern for developing Stepford Wives. Has anyone else seen this film? You're looking rather blank. Okay, three of us. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you click on the next quote, you'll see a quote here from uh, Richard Foster who says this. If you just click on. I should just click. Okay, I can uh, will it, will it just click. It'll be a click on, uh, on, there we go. Most of us have been exposed to such mutilated forms of authority submission that either we've embraced the deformity or we've rejected the idea altogether. To do the former leads to self-hatred and to do the latter leads to arrogance. So what he's encouraging us to not do is impose onto this passage all of the ways in which you've experienced this to not work in your past and assume, therefore, it's no good. Now, let's try and redeem it. What does it actually mean? And it doesn't mean, firstly, to be a doormat. That's not what Scripture puts forward for females. Actually, there's no such thing in Scripture as a female being made into someone who's passive. So to be submissive is not to be passive. 
And secondly, it's not about being domesticated. There's no, you notice there's no detail given in the passage that says, wives submit to your husbands and therefore do these certain chores. This has no relevance to who does the washing up or even who earns the main salary. Is it possible for a wife to be submitted to a husband but the main salary earner? Well, yes, it certainly doesn't say no, does it? So this is not about being domesticated. It's not about being a doormat. And it's not about being in danger. That's the other thing. That if this relationship of submission is actually dangerous to the woman, then actually that violates and, and invalidates that dynamic. That is to say, if the, the man is physically dangerous to the woman, she needs to contact other authorities to whom he is called to submit, namely the police, and not be in that relationship, at least in any active sense, for the time being. So this is not about being a doormat, it's not about being domesticated, and it's not about being put in danger. Whatever else it means, it can't mean uh, those three things. So what does it mean? Well, the word submission, to submit, is hupotasso in, in the Greek. And I have to be honest that I'm not exactly sure what it does mean. So I asked my wife, um, and uh, this is my wife, Charlotte, and I thought the best person to speak about what this might mean is probably her, because uh, it's not really my calling. So I said to Charlotte, you know, what does this mean to you? And this is what she, um, she uh, typed up, because as I said, she's away. Uh, she says this, as a young woman about to be married... I remember feeling that wives submit to your husbands was all heavily weighted in their favor. What was in it for me? I felt this submission thing was more like oppression for myself, my opinions and my preferences. We always tend to see things through our own self-centered lens and react in fear. How foolish I was looking back now with 13 years of real marriage experience. There have only been a couple of times when I've had to actually submit to what Andy believed to be the right thing. And both situations were ones where he demonstrated the principle of servant leadership. You're probably thinking I wrote this now, but genuinely, she wrote this. Um, (laughs) She wrote this, as I told her. No, no. She wrote this of herself. So here we were. We, We had been talking about some means of help for me as I was exhausted, leading a rapidly growing church with lots of messy lives and having a very active one and a half year old girl. And being heavily pregnant meant my resources were low. However, I am a coper who didn't want to accept help. And so it was Andy who insisted that Lucy went to childcare for a morning a week so that I could have a break. I think the point Charlotte's trying to make is that when this is working well, far from it being an oppressive thing, Christ is the head of the church in order that he might be its saviour. Did you notice that in the passage? So the role of the wife submitting to the husband is not to her detriment, but it should be to her benefit. That in some way, out of that dynamic, she will experience the grace and the help of leadership for the life that she's called um, to lead. So wives, in that sense, viewing it more positively, submit to your husbands. And one of the challenges of this is brought through in a phrase. Did you notice the phrase that's added to this? Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Did you notice that? Those little phrases, they're never throwaway for the Apostle Paul. Every word is careful, as to the Lord. What's being said here then is that in some way the wife is obeying Christ as she demonstrates submission in her relationship with her husband. And this may be for a couple of reasons. Maybe partly because many wives are in relationships where the husband in and of himself is not easy to respect. Let's be honest, sometimes us men, we behave more like boys and bachelors than men. And it can be a job for a woman to find that in us worthy of respect and fulfill that calling. Well, you notice the clause then is, well, in a sense, if you can't do it for him, do it for Christ. (laughs) Fulfill that calling as part of your obedience to Jesus. However much that is a challenge and however much time that requires personal sacrifice. And then the other thing is, sometimes he's not respectable, but sometimes he's not respected. And this is another problem, you see. Sometimes I wonder, this, this now cuts both ways, for husbands, two wives, wives, two husbands. Sometimes I, I wonder how much actually the way that we treat one another produces a person that we then struggle with. You see, if you respect a man, you may find that he becomes respectable. <laughs> if you honor a man, you may find that he becomes honorable, and of course, vice versa. And one of the pastoral lines, one of the, I, in my years as uh, pastoring churches and helping couples uh, struggles one of the lines i've frequently heard certainly several times is something it goes something like this in a couple that have decided it's not working we need help it's falling apart they'll say something like this i don't think i love them anymore they're not the person i married now of course the interesting thing if you analyze that statement is this what they're saying is this person's changed negatively 
And that change is since I married them. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> so what you're saying is, this person's negatively deteriorated since they started living with you. If you think it through, I know it hits rather hard, but actually, is it possible that we... Are, now, there may be many other reasons why that statement is true apart from that description or explanation. But is it possible, those of us who are married now, is it possible that we are far more responsible than we've ever realized for the very things in our spouse that we struggle with? We, we've caused some of it. We've created some of it by not operating and relating healthily to them. If, ladies, if he's too passive and doesn't seem to initiate, there may be many reasons for that. Is, but is part of it that he feels undermined by you? <laughs> That too many times you've criticized him in public or in private. You've nagged him and manipulated him a little bit emotionally. And, and eventually he just, it just kills in him that get-go that a man needs through encouragement. You see the point. And, and then we end up living with someone that's not the person we married. Listen, that's where we need to take responsibility. What can I do in my side of the relationship to build this person up so that they become the person that I want to be married to? That's part of the challenge. Amen? Now, I, I'm preaching to myself here. Please, as much as any of you, this is what I've got to work this through. And uh, my wife even more so, probably. How do we love one another in such a way that we become the person that we want to be? Let me put it this way. Ladies, as a car runs on fuel, so a man is fueled by encouragement, by respect, by honor. A man needs it. So fill him up <laughs> and watch him go. Amen? Now, I presume at this point, us men are feeling pretty pleased with ourselves. Um, and probably inwardly feeling like shouting out, preach it, brother. You, know? <laughs> you let them have it. Um, but unfortunately, that is a boomerang you know, that is coming right back at us now as we look at the male responsibility, which I think it's fair to say is even more demanding than the female. I'm probably biased as I say that. You appreciate that. But notice as Paul goes on to the men, he brings Christ to bear on them with no holes barred and says, as Christ loves the church. Husbands love your wives. What a calling this is for men. If you click on to the next slide then, this is husbands loving their wives. And before we think that we can reduce this to breakfast in bed on occasion, <laughs> I'm sure some of the ladies are thinking, well, it would be nice to start with that. Um, but before we can reduce it to that, as if all this means is every so often, no, actually, Paul brings the example of Jesus himself and even the model of Christ dying for his bride, for the church. And he says, now, husbands, that's your pattern for marriage. Wow. <laughs> that is a huge challenge, isn't it? As we look to do marriage, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ has shown his love for his bride, even to death on a cross. So far from it being just breakfast in bed, as the next slide shows, it's illustrated even by the bloody and brutal death of Christ, who gave himself for his bride. Let me share a couple of things that I think this means at least. Husbands, firstly, that we are to be the servants of our wives. We are to be their servants. We are to demonstrate servanthood in the way that we lead. For Christ gave himself. You notice then that simultaneously, this is the amazing thing about the, the pattern of Jesus, simultaneously he is the head of the church. He is the head of the organization, if you like. Now take that word and put it into a worldly context and we assume that the head of the organization sits in the nicest office does the jobs that only he does and sh or she does and doesn't do the jobs they don't want to do has the biggest salary and the greatest status <laughs> but of course christ has turned headship on its head <laughs> because the head has got down and washed the feet and that turns headship on its head doesn't it this is now a revolution in servant leadership for the head has served the body, even to death on a cross. So husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Get down and serve in whatever way practically and spiritually and emotionally is applicable. So firstly, this is about being a servant to our wives. Not thinking that they exist to make us happy, but rather as Christ has done, that he models a, a relationship where his existence has been given for our salvation, our freedom, um, and our joy. And then secondly, it's about sacrifice. It's about being a servant. It's also about sacrifice, isn't it? Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul alluding to this great act of Christ in his sacrificial love, even to death on a cross. He gave himself up 
for his bride. He sacrificed not just his rights, but even his very life to death on a cross. And you notice with Jesus that he did this not when we were doing all the things that we should have done. He did this when we were in the wrong, (laughs) when we'd failed him. It was for sinners that Christ died. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he surrenders his rights and his life, even as his bride is screwing up (laughs) and dies for her. What a model. Because again, as a husband, I know how often I think I'm off the hook if I can find any fault in my wife. Well, if she's not done this, I'm not going to... No, 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 that's not the logic of Christ at all, is it? (laughs) When we were not loving him, he loved us. When we were not right to him, he was faithful to us. Husbands, love your wives in that kind of way. Sacrifice your rights. Sacrifice uh, your hobbies sometimes. Sacrifice the way that you would like to spend your time or your money and serve your wife. Amen? As Christ loved the church. And uh, perhaps there are three ways particularly that we could hone in on this. Firstly, pray. Husbands, pray with and for your wives. Pray with and for your wives. That means a huge, makes a huge difference. Assuming they're a Christian who wants to pray, what a difference that makes. Because in our prayers, we affirm our love for one another. And it's much harder to have an argument with someone that you've just prayed with, isn't it? Have you noticed this? <laughs> that that spiritual atmosphere is created in prayer. And husbands, whatever else it means for us to be head, it partly means that we set the spiritual atmosphere in our homes. That as we initiate prayer, we're saying the Lord is here and we're going to act in his presence in the way we relate to one another. Now, that won't make us perfect, but it will certainly help. Pray with and for our wives. Secondly, provide for our wives. Pray for them. Secondly, provide for them. And of course, I don't just mean put bread on the table. (laughs) You know, there is a kind of old fashioned approach to the role of the husband that all he has to do is provide a salary that puts bread on the table. Actually, No, no, no. Our responsibility is more holistic than that. (laughs) It's not just about physical provision, that's relevant, but it's also about emotional provision, providing an atmosphere of affection, of affirmation, that means that our wives know that they're loved. It's not just that I, I love my wife, it's that I need to make sure that she knows that I love her. Has the Lord not done this for us? It's not just that he knows he loves us, he has communicated that he loves us. He sent the Spirit into our hearts to cry out, Abba, Father. And and all part of the Spirit's work is not just that that God loves us, but he wants us to know how much we're loved. Husbands, love your wives like that. Find ways to communicate so that she gets it, how you love her. I remember uh, hearing of a gentleman who got married and he said, "Uh, I told my wife on our wedding day that I loved her and I would let her know if the situation changes. (laughs) Uh, I hope that wasn't real or true, but... That's not enough, is it? It's not enough just to say I love you and you know see previous Valentine's cards for details. You know, it's it's got to be, it's got to be more of an active love than that, communicated in creative ways and frequently. Pray, provide, and thirdly, protect. Christ is the saviour of his bride, who is his body. Uh, He put his life on the line to be her saviour, and therefore he is her protector, the one who makes sure that she lives in an atmosphere and in a setting that's safe and secure. That's the role of Christ uh, for the church, to provide and protect for her. And he does this in a way that is not patronising. This isn't some damsel in distress thing. This is not, Christ doesn't patronize us in the way he saves us. Do you notice this? That by saving us, far from making us in a strange way unhealthily dependent on him, through our dependence on him, it's not that he takes away our control, but he gives us self-control. So the Savior operates in such a way not to remove our sense of agency and activity, but to initiate and, and make it possible. Husbands, love your wives in that kind of way. Be the one who provides and protects. And where there are toxic influences, people or programs or whatever it may be, husbands, protect your wife and your family from toxic influences. Guard the front door of your home that the house might be a setting, the home might be a setting of safety and of security. Husbands, love your wives. Isn't it tragic that the man who is meant to be the greatest source of safety for his wife so often becomes her greatest source of danger? Isn't that terrible? Isn't that an indictment on our culture that actually domestic violence is a terrible statistic 
when actually the husband is to be the protector of his wife. And I just want to make clear, you know, it may even be that some of us are not immune from this. And I want to encourage you, man, if, you, if you've ever intimidated your wife physically, either, maybe you've never actually physically hurt them, but you've, you've squared up to them until they back down. You've, you've used your physical size to intimidate. I want to encourage you to get help. And not from your wife, because she's scared of you. Get help from somebody who isn't. Because that must stop. And that must change, because you are to be her protector, never her danger. Amen? Husbands, love your wives, then, as Christ loved the church. And wives, submit and respect your husbands in everything. This is God's pattern for marriage. For best results, follow the maker's instructions. Do you think there's any way that we can hang this picture and say it's straight in our crooked culture? (laughs) I think there is. I think this still works. I think this is still God's pattern for marriage. But I also think that we struggle with this. And so I want to finish by saying this is not only the pattern for marriage, but it is also the power for marriage. See, there's something else to be added here, isn't there? Do you notice in this passage, it doesn't just give a pattern, but speaks of the marriage of Christ and the church as in some way a resource and a source of power to make our marriages work. So if you click onto the next slide, you see this is a profound mystery, Paul. Literally in Greek, it says a mega mysterium. This is a mega mystery. (laughs) But when I speak about the little marriages of husbands and wives, beyond that, looming larger than that, is the marriage of Christ and the church. And in some mysterious way, our little marriages can be connected to this great marriage, which is actually the big story of the Bible. The Bible starts with a marriage, Adam and Eve, and it finishes with a marriage, Christ and the church. And in some way, as we get married in the meantime, our little marriages are meant to connect with the power and the mystery of this great marriage. Here's how C.S. Lewis puts it. Uh, on On the next slide, he says this, in the imagery describing Christ and the church, we're dealing with husband and wife, not merely as facts of nature, but as the living and awesome shadows of the greater reality that is beyond our knowledge. Our marriages, they're just shadows of the real marriage. The real marriage is this mega mystery of Christ and the church. So I want to encourage you, as the next slide concludes, I want to encourage you to connect your (laughs) mini-marriage to this mega marriage. Because in this marriage of Christ and the church are the resources that every one of our mini marriages needs. In this marriage is the grace to forgive. And every little marriage needs to work on forgiveness. Amen? Do not keep a record of wrongs. Don't let bitterness and resentment seethe within you or burst out of you. Love keeps no record of wrongs. How how are you going to do that? You've got to connect your little marriage to this glorious marriage in which is the grace for forgiveness. The healing from hurts in the past. It's all there in the big marriage. The hope for a better future. It's all there in the big marriage. So connect our little marriages to this mega marriage and find not only a pattern, but also the power. I'll finish with a story. I remember when I was a child, um, we went as a family to a place called Tenby in South Wales. Anyone been to Tenby? A little sort of coastal resort. Lovely little place. Resort might be a bit glamorous, actually. But anyway, it's, it's a nice place. It's in Britain, so resort doesn't really... Anyway, it's a lovely little place. And uh, we went there as a family for a holiday. And I remember my father deciding that we would go in a rowing boat. You know, you can hire these boats in the harbour and we'd go for a little row. But uh, we, we decided to go out of the harbour. I think I was probably only about five, so I, I remember it vaguely. Um, and, uh, you know, I, my father probably decided, let's, let's go for a mission. <laughs> let's make this into a challenge. Um, and so we went out of the harbor, and there was a rock um, a, a little way in the distance. So he said, we're going to row around this rock. So off we went. But unfortunately, we got round the rock very quickly, not realizing we were going with the tide. And as we came back around the rock, all of a sudden, it all slowed down. And my father was rowing as hard as he could. I can still remember his face and the fear of, I'm putting everything into this that I've got, and we're not getting anywhere. We were just stuck in the water, putting everything in that we had. And so I remember being close to the rocks and thinking, you know, this is not good, as much as a five-year-old computes that. And then the next thing I remember, I remember sort of feeling it before I really saw it, but I remember feeling the power of another boat. Someone had seen this going on, and the lifeboat was launched from the harbor. And I remember feeling this other presence as it just roared up from behind us and uh, suddenly actually the other thing I remember was being hit by something because the safety line was thrown over from the the big boat to our little boat and we tied our little rowing boat onto the lifeboat and they pulled us 
uh, back to safety. You know, as I think about that, our little thing, we put everything into it that we'd got and we weren't getting anywhere, being connected up with this powerful thing and saved. And what I'm saying is our little marriages, you know, you can put a lot into it and still feel we're not getting anywhere. This feels a bit on the rocks. I want to encourage you to connect it up to the power of this marriage. And if you feel that this message has hit you around the head a little bit, can I encourage you to think that might actually be a safety line, a lifeline that you've just been thrown? Because the challenge is a wake up call to say, Lord Jesus, I can't do this marriage thing without you. Unless we live according to your pattern, and unless every day we say, Lord, give us your power, we can't do this thing. But by your grace, we can. And if you're married this morning, I want to encourage you. There's resources here by the grace of God. Wherever you're at, there's resources for what you need. Come and get them. (laughs) Set your life, your marriage on this pattern and according to his power. 